Uh, my name is Martha, and with Anders, Hallett, and Sheriff, uh, we are part of the Applied Research and Development Group at Foster and Partners. A lot of people have been asking, what did exactly Foster and Partners do with SPOT? So we're here to shed some light on some of uh, these questions. Uh, we're very excited to do this after Brian and David gave the fantastic presentation about uh, how SPOT is being used in construction. We're going to say a slightly different story of what it means to actually be an early adopters, uh, an, an early adopter in this uh, program. And we're very happy to be doing it here because it's here two years ago that we had our first serendipitous meeting with Boston Dynamics and that entire thing sparked to life. As I said before, we're part of ARD. Whoever kind of uh, joined our uh, presentation in the last session in another room knows a little bit about what we're doing. We have a wide breadth and depth within the office, and these are some of the areas of interest to us. Um, our main uh, target is to take research and innovation from the labs to the hands of the designers today. Uh, so we thought that with SPOT we had a fantastic opportunity to bridge two of our interests, robotics on one hand and digital twins on the other hand. So for many years, we, as others uh, along with us, have been exploring the possibilities of robots on design and construction. I think as it's obvious from here, from brick laying to 3D printing rebar, concrete 3D printing or even 3D printing metal, the construction industry has been constantly been evolving and augmented by robots. Uh, but it's not just for the manufacturing process alone that robots are good, right? Uh, Amazon Robotics, whom we met a few years back, have been instrumental in revolutionizing Amazon's operation in order for film and solutions. So along with everything else, we have been asking questions, uh, what would it mean if this type of robots were part of a building solution? And what if these robots could assist us to develop semi-autonomous reconfigurable spaces? Spot, on the other hand, offered an altogether different proposition. Um, Brian talked a little bit about its athletic intelligence. So a semi-autonomous quadripod robot that can balance itself, can navigate difficult terrain, avoid obstacles, and even pick itself up when it falls down. We instantly started thinking, what are the possibilities of using such a robot in an ever-changing environment like a building site? And furthermore, what it would mean in terms of exploring how could this allow us to convert as designed versus as built reality? Spot's ability to perform semi-autonomous consistent scans uh, for our building sites uh, could actually close this loop for us between the digital and the physical state of a building. And this can eventually, we thought, uh, make faster and more adaptive design to production and to construction cycles. This is because constant and quick checks to monitor accuracy, logistics, and timeframes on site can be instrumental in terms of integrating design and construction and allowing for further flexibility. But in addition to that, we have been investigating how these scans can be used not only during the construction process, but also while the building is operational. We, uh, as a firm, uh, as, as a team, we see great potential in digital twins, and I think uh, we, can, we all know a digital twin, twin is effectively a digital model of a physical asset or process in the real world. Uh, what you see on your screens is an image of our hub. It's a space in our campus that is very flexible, it's used for working and for socializing, has a wide range of furniture and is ever changing all the time. So we thought that scanning spaces like that on a regular time frame allows us to assemble a detailed digital twin of our own campus to begin with. Using them this twin, we can visualize and simulate interactions uh, between design spaces and understand how occupancy, environmental conditions, and energy uses, usage affect the space as a whole. Uh, we have a principle of eating our own dog food. So we first try all these things in our own office. This is uh, the idea of a smart building as it's applied in our campus, uh, as a smart campus. Uh, within our building, we check quality of air, occupancy data, and we try to understand how all these things can correlate with the ever-changing spaces that we have within the campus. For example, uh, in our hub, we were kind of uh, monitoring uh, CO2 against uh, the outside temperature, the inside temperature, and the occupancy of the space. And you will see that while the temperatures are pretty much the same, the CO2 uh, later, like later in uh, autumn, was much higher than the CO2 earlier in autumn. 
through our scans, we realize that that is only because somebody has closed the door during the more kind of cold months, and that meant that the CO2 levels directly went up, which is something that we wouldn't otherwise be able to understand. Also, sophisticated, up-to-date spatial information is very critical for wayfinding. You see here a three-dimensional app that we have, a wayfinding application within our office for our main studio space. Uh, taking into account environmental conditions and occupation of different uh, spaces, you can actually start creating apps that can find you where you can be around the building based on your particular needs. So you can imagine a digital assistant where you can ask uh, the computer, I want to find a quiet space that is not too hot for three people for a meeting, and then directly have a, a sort of location of where to go and how to go there. We talked a lot about this uh, post-occupancy twins, but also we have been doing a lot of things with uh, digital twins for construction. A construction twin can provide valuable information on progress, phasing, and congruence, on and the difference between as designed and as built, as we said before. So Sheriff is going to talk a little bit about uh, construction twins, and Anders is going to go talk a little bit about operational twins. But before all that, Salindit Hallett is going to talk a little bit about spot in general. Uh, so this part have actually uh, an overlap with Brian, so bear with me. I'm sure you have done it better. Uh, so as, Marcia, as uh, Martha mentioned, we've been always uh, interested in using uh, 3D scanning on site. And uh, we've met with Boston Dynamics in a previous uh, next build. And this got us talking uh, about using uh, a spot uh, on site. And we were actually invited to be part of the early adopters program. And at that time, we were the only architecture uh, company on the program. Uh, so F SPOT is a four-legged uh, semi-autonomous uh, industrial robot. It's uh, an internet sensation, so I'm sure you've seen it like uh, uh, towing trucks or like dancing to Bruno Mars or uh, doing all sorts of like choreographed dancing with, uh, with its friends. Uh, but it's also a very capable robot, so it can maneuver tricky terrain. Uh, it's controlled by uh, um, a tablet that can uh, actually control it uh, manually and autonomously. So when you're uh, actually using Spot manually with a joystick, Spot, uh, spot uh, sensors is always there to help you. So uh, the way it works is Spot can actually detect a lot of obstacles surrounding it, and it can adapt to it and it's to its best ability. So for example, if you see in this video here on the right, so we're actually moving Spot only forward, and Spot was able to go around uh, a column easily. And on the, on the left, you can see it like uh, uh, going uh, through our uh, uh, stairs in the main uh, studio with ease, also we're just also doing forward, and then it's just like going up the stairs, which was great. Uh, spot can also be set free, and uh, where you can just press play, and it can follow a pre-recorded uh, 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 map on its own. Uh, this, uh, this part actually will, will have more in detail later. All of these capabilities make it like a great tool to use on site because it can go almost uh, uh, everywhere a human can go and even more places a human can't. Uh, and it can also overcome obstacles which I have seen other robots uh, like wheeled robots really struggle with. Uh, it can also customize by the array of accessories. Uh, Brian have seen a lot of these, uh, from uh, GPU computing, uh, CPU computing, all sorts of sensors, even a robotic arm. Uh, our setup had a LiDAR scanner on the front, and this was to help with, uh, 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 and, and this is kind of like the same scanner that's used in an autonomous car, uh, and it used to assess the spot with, it, with uh, navigation through maps. Uh, and uh, the other accessory was a high-resolution 3D scanner made by Faro. Uh, and at the time, this was the uh, uh, only integration available. Uh, now there's much more uh, uh, integrations uh, that you can use. And the scanner we used was a uh, Faro uh, M70. Uh, usually, usually, the scanner used manually, where a person moves the scanner to one location, take a scan, uh, uh, runs away so he, he doesn't appear on the scan itself, and uh, he keeps doing this task for uh, multiple location to cover like a larger site. Uh, you can then take all the scans uh, and go back to the PC, and then you start a process called registration. I'm sure some people uh, of you here have done it, 
and it's usually a tedious process because a lot of times this is what you get, right? So you get all the scans back, but they're all in the origin and they're not like um, uh, related to each other. Uh, and then you need to figure out how you would be able to register these scans. You start by uh, grouping them into smaller groups, uh, trying the auto registration, and then sometimes this fails. You need to do manual registration where you find like uh, features in both scans. And the process become, takes longer and longer. Uh, Spot, on the other hand, have like a great feature where like starting from uh, a known location using a marker, which is what you see on, uh, on the left. Um, it can record a map uh, of its surroundings, and it can record its movement through this map. Uh, and it can also go and repeat this pass over and over again, even if the surroundings uh, started changing slightly as well. So it adapts its movement even if the surroundings change. Uh, on the tablet, you can see how it defines uh, obstacles uh, uh, in real time. So while moving autonomously, you can see it can uh, actually check if it's uh, anything it's, uh, it's coming, uh, it, it is uh, on its way, and then it can adapt to it. Um, during the mission, we can define some points where we ask uh, Spot to take uh, scans. Uh, and when we run the mission later, each time we run the mission, a scan is taken in the exact position. And uh, the important part is, uh, is we can actually embed location data uh, that uh, Spot have from uh, its, uh, its map into the scans, which uh, give us like a very different experience when you go to, into registration, because uh, on the right here is the raw data coming from the scanner, uh, already with the uh, location data embedded, so you can see it's very well structured, and then the registration is much easier. Again, it's what you get if you don't have any location data embedded in it. Um, now, Anders will tell us more about uh, uh, how we have been uh, uh, using Spot, so I'll move to Anders. Thank you very much, Khaled. So, in the most general sense, Spot is useful whenever we want to get four-dimensional information. So that is a snapshot of a space at a particular point in time, or when we do these repeated scanning sessions, how a space changes over time. But you might also want to say how time changes over space. So how do decisions about construction facing issues affect the amount of time required for a particular operation? Or how do spatial arrangements of furniture, for instance, affect the amount of time required for, uh, affect the amount of time that people spend in the space? And then Spot's ability to gather um, spatial data at regular interval, that's a big piece in understanding this puzzle. So we were describing uh, these 4D models as twins. And for this project, we have grouped our, um, our study cases into the following two. On the left-hand side, we're calling it the construction twin, which is the 4D representation of a construction site. So here we're comparing the BIM model to how the as build progresses over time. And on the right-hand side is the post-occupancy twin, um, which is focusing on how a physical space is being used. So here, Spatial snapshots from Spot are used in combination with other data sources, such as occupancy levels, as well as environmental information. So all in all, we managed to do about 280 scans with Spot. Um, and when this project started, Spot was on, on version 1.6. And sorry to tell you, Brian, you are actually running into a lot of technical issues. Um, but a, as a part of this early adapter program, we were providing feedback to Boston Dynamics about these issues. So when we got around to round two in um, July and August last year, a lot of our requested features were implemented at that point. Um, later in this presentation, um, Sheriff will tell more uh, about uh, some of these changes. Um, yes. So um, for the case study for the post-occupancy twin, we were using this space in our London campus called the hub. So as Martha um, previously mentioned, um, this is a flexible space and the use case goes from being a breakout space to a space for focused work, for lectures, and for social events. And the spatial arrangement um, of the furniture changes accordingly and therefore it gives us a variety of different spatial uh, configurations to investigate. So as a part of a separate research initiative, we've been using this same space um, as a test bit for smart building technologies. So we have live environmental data, that is temperature, 
humidity as well as CO2 levels for the space. And we have also live occupancy information. So a research goal here was looking for spatial insights by comparing the point clouds with the environmental and occupancy information. So we were scanning the hub on different dates with slightly different spatial configurations. Uh, the plan you see here is actually the, a plan view of a point cloud, and the yellow dot, that was the scanner locations, so from where Spot would scan the space. Um, at this point in time, as I mentioned before, Spot was in version 1.6, and one of the limitations back then, which is a year ago, uh, was that we had to do the whole mission, so all eight scans in one go. So if the robot got stuck or lost Wi-Fi connectivity, we actually have to redo it all. Um, in addition to that, we wanted to scan this space in relatively fine detail. I think, and we also added uh, colors to the scan. So we spent about five minutes per scan. Um, with the configuration that we had, there was a cage that protected the scanner. Um, this was important specifically on the construction side, but we wanted to try to scan without this cage um, because the cage actually occludes parts of the point cloud. Um, so we ended up first doing a test run, and then we did the f just to ensure that the robot was able to see all of um, the furniture and obstacles. Then once that was successful, we would walk the full route. Um, so the first time we went um, with, hub, uh, with Spot to the hub, I think we spent all evening just setting up, learning how to use Spot and so on. But then when we got around to the third time, we spent literally just an hour, which included um, powering on the robot, bringing the robot, um, turning on the scanner, aligning the robot with the marker, doing the test run, and then the fully um, automated 40-minute uh, mission. So for these repeated scanning sessions, a spot's automation features, they add a lot of value. Um, so what you see here is a comparison between two different dates, two different point clouds. And one of the small subtleties is that this presentation board here on the left-hand side that was only present in one of the two days. Um, another small subtlety is on the right-hand side, you'll see a flower vase that also will disappear in a moment. It's disappeared now. And all the way in the back on the left-hand side in a moment, uh, we'll see this silhouette of a person. You can see her now. And she's probably thinking, what is a robot dog doing in here? Um, but kidding aside, um, here we're talking about a board, a vase, and a person. Um, but imagine using this process for doing daily scans of your space and documenting the small changes you have in your space. Um, what would that mean um, to how you understand and operate uh, spaces using these kinds of digital twins over time? Um, now Sheriff will go into further detail about our con work on the construction side. So with construction twins, like Anders mentioned, we're interested in tracking uh, a specific set of processes and how they affect the progress of construction on site. Um, we worked on two different sites. One of them is Battersea Power Station, uh, and we worked on two different levels. They were in different uh, construction stages. Uh, the first one that you see here was level seven. It was an early construction stage. So the whole space was very empty and it was very easy to uh, do the path planning and the scans with spot. It was basically a walk in the park, except for like people on site ganging up on spot every 15 minutes to take selfies. But aside from that, if we go to the, the first floor, which was in a later construction stage, the rooms were already defined. Uh, mechanical equipment that was about to be installed later uh, was stored on the ground, so uh, path planning was a bit uh, challenging. You can see over here the floor plan for um, the, the different rooms, and some of the challenges that we were facing with spot 1.6, uh, like Anders mentioned, uh, was the battery capacity. So uh, if the battery died along the mission, you would have to start the mission from scratch. And similarly, if there were any com drops uh, between the controller and spot, you would have again to repeat the mission. So uh, we decided to just split it up into smaller missions uh, so that we can handle uh, if any of those things happen. And then COVID hit. So during lockdown, we decided to move the whole operation somewhere more controllable and closer to the office. 
way closer. This is one of the buildings on campus. It's called 7-Eleven, and there were some retrofitting happening to the space, uh, the mechanical equipment and the ceiling. So we decided to test spot again training, uh, um, uh, scanning the space and tracking what's happening. Uh, this was another floor, and this was actually the the first time we managed to do an auto walk mission with Spot with 17 scans. And one of the main reasons we were able to do that was that now we were using Spot 2.0. Um, there were general, uh, a lot of general stability improvements to the operating system, um, but also two main features that helped a lot was the ability to swap batteries uh, uh, in between autonomous scans. So at any point, if the battery is about to uh, die, Spot would just lie down, allow you to swap batteries, and then it would continue from the same position while maintaining um, the coordination between the, the uh, locations. And similarly as well, if there are any comms drops, it would just lie down on the ground, wait for you to approach it a little bit to gain connection with the tablet, and then it would stand up, you can proceed with taking a manual scan to replace the one that was uh, dropped, and it proceeds with the whole mission. So this was great and, and allowed us to do longer scans faster. You can see here some of the scans collected from the two different levels. Um, there were some also site-specific challenges. Uh, so over here you can see some materials that affected Spot's localization or ability to, to figure out its location within the space and as a consequence its ability to navigate as well. Uh, things like the ceiling panels that had very small perforations or the bubble wrap that was used to uh, cover stuff. Uh, similarly, the insulation materials for the ducts. All of those affected uh, uh, its ability to figure out where it is and all of those things were communicated again to uh, Boston Dynamics. The other interesting feature that was added in 2.0 um, was the ability to pause spot uh, in a specific way prior to taking the scan. Uh, the whole place was full of desks, so previously you, we weren't able to do that on the construction side. There were some rooms that were full of desks and they were basically occluding the scanner. So now while you're recording your mission, basically you can ask it to do a specific action or take a specific pause and then proceed with the scan while maintaining this pause until the scan ends, which was very useful in this site. Another thing we faced as well, which again is to be expected in a construction site, um, layout changes. So over here, this happened after we finished recording the, the whole mission for the 17 scans. And then one day while we were replaying the mission, uh, those uh, pipes were added into the space. And what Spot is trying to do here is to reach to that space uh, on the far end of the uh, floor uh, where there was a waypoint it needs to go and stand on to do a scan. Uh, and it will just keep trying to reach it while being blocked by surroundings. And again, as part of being um, of the early adapters program, we were expected to provide uh, Boston Dynamics uh, feedback about what someone with such technology on site would expect and what would be intuitive ways to resolve kind, those kind of things. And surprisingly and amazingly so, they were very receptive to most of our uh, suggestions. And we got to trial uh, Spot 3.0 a week ago where uh, all of those things have been resolved. Uh, and you could see it in Brian's uh, presentation where you're actually able prior to replaying a recorded mission to see an overview of the whole path and the actions that should be taking along the path. And you can just, if you see that something is already blocked, you can choose to skip it. And also while you're recording the mission, you can choose that for a specific action. If any blockage happens later on in the future, whether Spot should go to its docking station or it should ask the operator, what do you want to do? Do you want to proceed? Do you want to skip and so on? Once all the data is gathered, um, you would start looking at comparing your design intent represented in a BIM model to the point cloud data that you're collecting from the site. And on the left, you can see this happening to a floor plan of Battersea Power Station with the point cloud data that we collected. And you can see something 
uh, over there highlighted in red that doesn't look to be in the right place. And another type of um, uh, analysis you could do is point cloud to point cloud deviation uh, to see what's changing between different scans. Both tasks are still uh, tedious in a sense and require a lot of manual labor to do. Uh, so we started looking whether there is something already in the market that can help us uh, close the loop or offer this end-to-end -end automated solution for the whole process. And that's where Avir came in. Uh, Avir, like uh, Brian mentioned in passing, they offer uh, this web service that allows you to upload your BIM model as well as point cloud data uh, while collecting it every other day or something. And what they do is, over here you can see the, the BIM model and the point cloud data uh, displayed on top. Um, and over here you can start defining a specific threshold uh, of deviation. And what happens once the point cloud data is uploaded, it's processed and compared to your BIM elements. And you can see specific elements highlighted in red that are deviating in the point cloud data than the BIM model above the threshold you set. And what you could do later is automate the process of creating a report where those things can be uh, automatically sent to different stakeholders uh, to review and take action on it. So the whole process was covered by different media outlets um, and thanks are definitely due to Boston Dynamics. And one of the interesting things to highlight was the speed of iteration between different uh, missions that we were running. After every mission, we would provide uh, feedback, and the next time, the experience running the mission would be completely changed due to the, to the better, due to the updates that they kept uh, providing. And also, thanks are due to Spot, uh, where most suffering took place, especially in uh, London's balanced weather. Uh, yeah, slippages, but it still remained uh, very photogenic. And that's why we created this video, so you can see what it suffered with us. Here at Foster and Partners, we have been at the forefront of research for the built environment for over 50 years. We have teamed up with Boston Dynamics as part of their early adopters program for SPOT, the semi-autonomous robot, to investigate how cutting-edge technologies can push the boundaries of both design and construction while enhancing productivity, efficiency, and collaboration. 3D laser scanning technology to capture and monitor on-site progress was integrated into a strategic plan developed by our Applied Research and Development Group. This enables SPOT to capture constant, quick, and consistent scans of construction sites. This precision monitoring tracks progress while still checking as-built versus as-designed models. Scanning and post-processing times have been reduced from weeks to a matter of days, while freeing up staff resources. Spot's remote control features greatly improve site visit safety and efficiency. Together with its ability to follow a pre-mapped route, Spot provides consistent repeated scans, navigates difficult terrain, and can access hard-to-reach areas on site. This technology could be used to create four-dimensional models of our buildings, highlighting how they change over time. Combined with data from sensors that read environmental conditions and occupancy, we can create an intricate model of how people, furnishings, and environmental conditions interact. These four-dimensional models could become virtual collaboration spaces, available to people who cannot physically be in the same location. Foster and Partners at Boston Dynamics will continue to push the boundaries of innovation, bringing the technology of the future in the hands of our designers today.